When we talk about trauma, we don't talk enough about this. The tendency in people who didn't get their emotional needs met when they were kids to form profound attachments to the idea of another person and to struggle to tell the difference between that idealized concept of that person and actual relationship. It's happened to a lot of us and it's so, so sad. It sucks the soul out of you. So I first talked about this a couple months ago. I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one if you want to see it. But the word for this phenomenon is limerence. And ever since I talked about it, there's been a huge reaction here on my YouTube channel. So many people have struggled with this before. Limerence is the word for a kind of romantic infatuation or obsession with someone that usually does not involve a full actual relationship. Sometimes it's with someone you know, sometimes it's with a total stranger like a celebrity or someone from your past who you once knew, but it takes over your mind so much so that it can seem to your friends like you're not yourself anymore. It can seem crazy. And one of the key signs of it is that rather than being in a relationship with someone, you're thinking about them all the time, going over and over the little bits of contact you had, if you had any, what they said, what they did, what they posted, the dreams you had about them. Everywhere you go, you're searching for hidden meaning. You know, is it a sign that could possibly tell you that they actually love you even though they're not in your life? So I'm gonna be sharing some letters on this in the coming weeks. And the first one I'm gonna do is from someone I'll call Elizabeth and she writes, Hi Anna, my name's Elizabeth. I wanna ask a question about an emotionally unavailable man I have interest in. It's more like an obsession, she says. Let's call him Max. By the way, I should first say that he has a public image in his country. He's wealthy, so he's not trusting of any person because as you might imagine, wealthy people are taken advantage of easily. Anyway, we knew each other through common friends but never really got to know each other. There was no friendship between us. When I wanted to pursue a relationship with him, yeah, I know it's unhealthy to chase a guy, and tried to make my friend fix me up with him, I was living in his country and was not far from where he lived. Anyway, this happened in the past, over five years ago. I was very unhealthy back then. I had a string of toxic relationships. I had crippling anxiety and self-esteem issues. So when I was chasing Max then, he didn't seem interested in me. He also had toxic relationships to deal with and was also unhealthy. He coped with his issues using alcohol, but he got sober. My friends told me about it, although now I'm not sure that it was true that he got sober. After a while, I stopped being interested in him and found someone nice, but we broke up shortly afterward. After the breakup, Max contacted me on social media and asked me to talk with him over the phone. However, I wasn't at all in a good mental space at that time due to the breakup and a family death I was dealing with. I was really crushed and I didn't expect Max to message me so suddenly. Anyway, I cut him short and said I couldn't talk to him, but he should contact me later. I truly thought he'd follow up with me later, but he didn't. This was four years ago and since then he has been silent. Three years ago I moved out of the country he was living in. It wasn't the country I grew up in. I moved to his country for studies and to get away from my abusive parents. My mother is a severely covert narcissistic person. Now I live in my native country. I came back from abroad to live with my mother because I wanted to give her another chance. It was a huge disappointment, but I had to try it. I sometimes think of Max and what could have been between us, and I'm not sure if this is healthy. I also need to point out that he's 45, unmarried, and with no children, and I'm 39, unmarried, with no children. I did say goodbye when I left his country, but of course, there was no response from him on social media. I don't know him well, but from experience I have about men in general and my past relationships, he's not toxic or unsafe. He is, however, unavailable due to his own personal issues. I'm circling things because I'm going to come back and go over this letter. Now that we live in different countries and don't have any contact with each other on social media, he barely uses social media, I'm not sure if something is ever going to happen again. My question is this, 
Is what I feel for him limerence or healthy, mature love? You've talked about limerence on your YouTube, and I trust your opinion on this. Is it worth saving myself up for him? Or should I just bite the bullet and admit to myself that this was a fantasy that I indulged in and I only got crumbs from it? You might ask why I'm holding on to him. Well, we have many things in common. We're both artists, we're both smart, creative, and kind. We have a sense of humor and we're world travelers. We're friendly and we love people. We also have similar values, religious, family, work, career, values, etc. And we both struggle in relationships. The difference is that he has accumulated a lot of wealth and I'm poor. Anyway, my fear is that if I let him go, I'll never find anyone like him. The guys I usually meet are boring and have little personality or artistic skills. Max has an incredible personality, which is why I couldn't cut ties with him emotionally all the time. But I feel if I don't cut ties with him, I'll wait for that social media message from him for the rest of my life and will stay single forever. And this is frightening to me. I feel like all this time I've built him up in my mind just because I was scared of putting myself out there and meeting someone new who's available and healthy, who is responsive and does not run from me or ignore me. I have CPTSD due to being raised by my narcissistic mother and unavailable father, and my mind believes that it is safer to stay in the past because at least I know what to expect from it. I know how it will all go. But change is unpredictable and gives me a lot of anxiety. Does this make sense? All the best to you, Anna, and thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I think you got a case of limerence. So let me see if I can help you uh, go through and see where this is showing up and help you to set yourself free from it. But let's see what you can learn from this. All right, so going back over the letter. I wanted to ask a question about an emotionally unavailable man I have an interest in. It's more like an obsession. So right there I'm going to say yes, it's more like an obsession. And this diagnosis of him as emotionally unavailable, I think that might be a misapplication of that. Now he might be, he might not be. What he is is, I'm just going to tell you right up front, he's shown no sign of being interested in you. You got one contact from him on social media. And it sounds like that's the only time he ever indicated an interest in talking to you. All right, so an emotionally unavailable person, usually that would be somebody who you're in a relationship with and they try to be in the relationship, but they can't love you or they can't be present for you. But this is somebody who's just flat out unavailable. It's not just emotional. He's, unav he's, he's not there. He's not even in your life. You haven't had contact in four years. So... This is a big clue that this is a limerent relationship, okay? Um, and then you say he has a public image because he's wealthy. Well, so people who are wealthy probably get a lot more than the normal share of people who are interested in them. And that's something to ask yourself. Um, and sometimes the reason, you know, if he's artistic and wealthy, you know, I, you're not giving information about him and I appreciate that. We don't really know. but. If he is well-known and wealthy for his artistic abilities and he's very visible and known, then sometimes that is a super attractive quality and sometimes could set off limerence. And, and when people have that highly visible profile, it's easy to feel like we know them even when they don't really know us. But I get that you were acquainted. So you knew each other through common friends but never really got to know each other. There was no friendship. So big clue there. There is not even a friendship. You don't actually know each other. When you wanted to pursue a relationship with him and you say, yeah, I know it's unhealthy to chase a guy. Um, well, chasing a guy, trying to, you know, trying to get a friend to set you up with somebody, that's not inherently unhealthy. I think it might not be strategic, but it's, you know, that's, not, that's not the part that's limerent. Um, you were hoping your friend would fix you up. The thing is here, he, did not, he didn't bite. He didn't respond to that. So whether your friend did anything, he had his chance to be interested in you and he, he wasn't. And I know that might be painful to hear, Elizabeth, but I just see no evidence that he is interested in you at all or was when he had the chance to meet you. This happened some years ago and I, and I, I think you're saying it started like 12 years ago. It went on until five years ago. And you say you were very unhealthy back then. You had a string of toxic relationships. You had crippling anxiety and self-esteem issues. So yeah, 
sounds like you have CPTSD. It showed up in your relationships. And when we're in that state, when you're having horrible relationships that are making you miserable and you're having crippling anxiety and your self-esteem is bad, limerent relationships are just delicious. You know, they look so good because you can kind of escape all of this. You can escape the plane where everything's a struggle and imagine this happy relationship where you get your emotional needs met. And I know you you're going to be talking about your parents here. And I think that's a huge clue too, that your mom was totally self-centered, couldn't be there for you. Your dad was unavailable. So I see this again and again, I'm learning so much. And I, it's not, it's not like it was unknown to the world or to the people who are professionals in this field, but what happens when you're a kid, I just keep seeing this, this 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 pattern of CPTSD where somebody wasn't even real to their parents and they become very vulnerable to relationships that aren't real. And if you know what I mean by real, like for parents to see the reality of their kid, they know who you are, they know how you feel, they care about it. They're down there on the floor with you working out problems and helping you understand yourself and loving you and helping you form self-esteem at, at the same time as having self-awareness to know when you're not sharing your toys. So it sounds like if your parents couldn't do that for you, there's a way that a person doesn't doesn't feel real. And I just keep seeing this over and over again. So we're going to talk about how you can become more real. So you were chasing him then and he didn't seem interested. And I'm just going to say since it didn't result in any kind of dating or anything, this is the tough love, Elizabeth. He wasn't interested. If a guy is interested in you, he will show up, he will let you know. He'll be present, he'll ask you out. So he wasn't interested, it wasn't just seem. But that's the limerence going, well, you know, there's no evidence that he's interested, but I'm looking for signs, I'm feeling something, we have so much in common. Some people go into magical thinking, they think about like, you know, in reality, he doesn't realize it yet, but we're, you know, soulmates, or he doesn't realize it yet, but we had a past life together. There's a lot of ways that we, that we trick ourselves into so that we can keep obsessing on somebody because it's giving us comfort in a horrible emptiness. And just like a drug, it can kind of like get you off the hook in the moment, but it ends up leading to greater emptiness down the line. And that's what's happening here. You still haven't had the kind of relationship that made you happy. So let's assume that's the goal here and keep looking at what happened with this guy, Max, in light of that, of how we can help you move towards it. So then you said he coped with his issues using alcohol and then he got sober and your friend said so, but you're not sure that he did. Well, so that's interesting. You're obsessing on somebody who has alcoholism and um, many of us have done that, but it's just, you know, it's just a fact. Somebody who's an alcoholic is very unlikely to be a good partner. Somebody who has, um, you know, you go on to say he has toxic, he drink, he, he has alcoholism, he has toxic relationships, he has issues. So it sounds like even if he were interested in you, the chances of having a great relationship with him or, you know, he's not in that place. But there's the main problem, and that is that he's not interested enough to even stay in touch with you. Okay, that's the main thing. So whether he drinks or not is not even your, your concern anymore. He's not in your life. So after a while, you stopped being interested in him and you found someone nice, but broke up soon after. Yeah, that's what we do. After the breakup, Max contacted you on social media and asked to talk over the phone. Okay, so there's the big moment you were waiting for, but you were not in a good mental space. You had had a breakup. There was a family death. You were feeling terrible and you said, I can't talk to you right now, but will you talk to me later? And you thought he would, but he didn't. You haven't heard from him since then. That was 2017. So I would say when, if you've been kind of pursuing a guy for, what was that, seven years, and he never took an interest, and then one day he calls you, he reaches out and says, oh, give me a call. But when you say you can't talk right then, or you need a little time and he doesn't call back, I would just say, I don't know what that call was, but it wasn't any big thing where he realized that you were the one for him. If he did feel that way, he would have called you back, because again, if a person is interested in you, and I'm saying this to everybody, a man or a woman, they will let you know. If they're interested, they'll let you know, especially if it's safe to be interested. So the one case where people sometimes keep these things secret is if they don't think you like them. But if you've been pursuing them for years, they know, and they will let you know if they feel the same way. And he didn't, okay? It's sad, but there it is. 
and this is good, it's really good, you know, sometimes just a clear fact is so helpful to set us free so that we can move on and actually have real love, right? So this is a good thing. This is how sometimes the news you fear is the happy news. Because <laughs> you go, yay, you're free, you're free. You can stop obsessing on a ghost, right? All right, so then you said a couple years after that, you moved out of the country he lives in. You sent a goodbye message, he didn't reply. So there's your 100% confirmation, right? He's not in your life. He's, he's not in communication with you. He could be, but he chooses not to be, all right? So now you're back in your native country and you came back to live with your mom because you wanted to give her a chance. And it's been a huge disappointment. You know, so you're in your late 30s. And so a couple years ago, you were still in your late 30s. So it's interesting to me that you would make a move for the sake of your mom at that time. But I don't know, that's probably another story. But it, I, I get the sense of you kind of traveling around the globe, trying to find the love that's going to help you get your needs met. I mean, your dad wasn't there at all, and she was narcissistic. So yeah, you probably hoped. I get it. Yeah, you wanted love. You wanted love, and that's always what it is. Everything bad I've ever done, everything dysfunctional I've ever did, I, I, I did because I needed love, and I was lonely. So I think, I think a lot of people can relate to that. So it's okay, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, you're showing a common pattern that people get from trauma. So you say, sometimes I think of Max and what could have been between us, and I'm not sure if this is healthy. I think that sometimes thinking of people from the past, there's no problem with that, but when you keep thinking what could have been, I think you have your answer about that, and that's the fantasy. It's, it's, it's just a temptation to go visit this fantasy where you are loved and everything's wonderful with this, you know, and artistically free. And you say you're artistic, but, and maybe you're just not telling me stuff here, but I'm not hearing anything in your life where that artistry is expressed. And I think that happens too around trauma is that I believe you that you have artistic ability, but it's kind of hooked onto this other person. Like if we could just be together, I could set free this gift I have for art. And that's really common, but it's not true. It, there is a such thing as people who create um, a life or an environment for you that allow you to set your gifts free, but they're never the ones who treat you like crap. They're never the ones who just like don't even return your calls. Th that would not be it. So then you say, you remind me that he's 45, not married and with no kids. You're 39. So yes, those are marriageable ages. That would be ideal, except let's go back to the main fact. He chooses not to have any contact with you and doesn't know you. Okay, so... You, so yes, you said goodbye, he didn't reply. You don't know him well, but from experience you've had about men in general, he's not toxic or unsafe. So Elizabeth, I'm just gonna say, I think you should handle that with tender hands because I mean to say, hold it lightly. That in your past experience, you haven't had good judgment about who's toxic or unsafe. You've had a string of terrible relationships. And so if you're like the rest of us with CPTSD that isn't healed yet, it's just not something you're very good at detecting in advance. It's really common. You didn't do anything wrong. The way that you were raised inevitably almost results in that kind of um, broken red flag detector. But when you say, I don't know, it, from what you're saying, there's no evidence that he's not toxic or, not, or, or unsafe and the drinking in particular. I mean, somebody with a problem with alcohol is inherently toxic and unsafe. Now they might recover, but but again, if somebody who you had had a relationship with had, with had alcoholism and you were hoping that they would get sober, if they got sober, that would just be like the beginning of a very long road on the question of, are they a suitable person for you? When alcoholism is active, the answer is no. The answer is never yes with an active alcoholic. It's a you know, it's just a huge barrier to a real happy relationship or having your emotional needs met. That's why alcoholism is such a bummer for the person who has it and the person who tries to love the alcoholic. So um, it's a challenge. Sometimes people are already married to an alcoholic and they have children and they're invested and there's all kinds of reasons to then, you know, go to Al-Anon and learn how to live with the alcoholism and find peace whether the alcoholic stops drinking or not, right? But if, you're not, if this person is not even your friend, I'm just saying, honey, you know, no, don't pursue relationships with alcoholics. Um, now that we live in different countries, 
and don't have any contact with each other on social media, I'm not sure if, if something's ever going to happen. No, I, there's no evidence that anything's going to happen. And even if it did, um, it would be random out of the blue from somebody you don't really know. So I'm going to strongly encourage you to set yourself free from any hope in this relationship so that you can have hope in real relationships. So then you say, my question is this, is what I feel for him limerence, which is obsession with the idea of a person or healthy, mature love? I'm just going to say, by definition, this is limerence because what you're into is the idea of him. You don't even have a friendship with him. It's not possible to have healthy, mature love for somebody you don't know. That, that could be admiration, that could be attraction, that could be obsession, but it can't be healthy, mature love. Healthy, mature love is by definition a mutual thing between people who know each other, who care about each other, who are invested in the best for each other, who are present for each other. That's healthy, mature love. So let's go with limerence. You diagnosed it yourself. And then you say, is it worth saving myself up for him? Or should I just bite the bullet and admit to myself that this was a fantasy that I indulged in and I only got crumbs from it? There again, you see it, Elizabeth. I know you see it. It is the latter. It's a fantasy you indulged in and you only got crumbs from it. You barely even got crumbs. I mean, one contact. Ah. And then when you asked, is it worth saving myself for him? So there's this noble idea of saving yourself for someone and saving yourself for someone who's actually committed to you um, is one thing, but saving yourself for, per for a person you don't even really know or have a friendship with, I would say that's more in the category of avoidance. You're protecting yourself. You find it safer to be in the fantasy of future love versus all the difficulty and the slog of actual people love. And I can see why you feel that way, but if you want real love, the path to it is to come back down from the fantasy, back down to earth, back to the real men of the world who you meet, who right now you're judging as boring, but believe me, there are all kinds of men in the world. There are men who have everything that you listed about yourself in common. They have that in common with you too. And they're available for a relationship. And you have the opportunity, you're, you're at an age where it's entirely easy to date men and learn if there is some kind of mutual feeling there that could grow into real mature love. Real mature love takes time to develop and it's pretty hard to accomplish when you're still in so much pain and self-esteem difficulty and you know just the crazy making phenomenon of CPTSD. <laughs> when you're in that, it's pretty hard to have healthy, mature love because instead what there is, is what um, some people call attachment hunger, right? You're just like, I, I really wanna be attached, can't deal with real men, but there's this guy I don't really know and I just remember my idea of him and it's so beautiful. And I want to be in that idea, but it's an idea. So back to earth, back to the, back to all of us boring earthlings here. We're not boring. We're actually quite uh, wonderful, colorful, different, interesting. And the reason people seem boring is because right now you're kind of high on a fantasy. And just as somebody, let's say they were addicted to heroin. Okay. If they were addicted to heroin, and they were hanging around a bunch of people who <laughs> were spending the holiday together and they weren't high on anything and they didn't drink, they would think that was boring too. In fact, alcoholics think people who aren't drunk are boring. So effectively, some people would call this a form of love addiction and I'm just sort of going to put a question mark like, is it an addiction? I don't know. It's an attachment wound. It's an attachment wound. It's certainly you know, it quacks like a duck. It acts like an addiction. This limerent idea, it's like an addiction. And when you're in your addictive behavior, everything that's not that is gonna feel boring. Nothing can seem to get in there. And that's part of what, that's part of what makes it so hard to be in a limerent state, is like, you can't taste anything. You can't smell anything. Uh, metaphorically speaking, you can't feel anything. No one's getting through. You're not getting through. A huge part of yourself is kind of up in this fog here, you know, where you're imagining the relationship that you might have and you're not experiencing the person who's right in front of you. And so it can be painful. It can be like withdrawal to come back down out of that cloud and just be on earth and start paying attention to people. And usually if the difficulty for you has been with men, 
then women friends are going to be good. If your mom has been difficult for you, you, you know, a, a lot of people with difficult moms don't feel a lot of trust with women or they don't feel affinity and they find it easier to be friends with men. And so one thing you're always going to hear me recommend is to find groups such as 12 step programs because you know often if you've been in an obsessive relationship there's often financial catastrophe following that if you can't be present on earth well earning a living is a is an earth thing so unless you're independently wealthy i'm guessing this this is an area that's hard for you so you can you can go to 12 step fellowships they're free there's group therapy there's ways that you can be together with just women or men and women but something where there's no possibility of romance, where you can just begin to practice connecting with other people and practice being real. Because that's what I wanted to address. The little bit you told me about your childhood, the narcissistic mom, the unavailable dad, what, how I see you as somebody, you're having trouble feeling the reality of yourself. You are a real flesh and blood woman. You crave love like all human beings. You want to be loved by a real person who can actually love you, not an idea. And you, you're just having trouble like connecting that, the reality of yourself to a real person. So you practice real relationships with people. And there's a way back. You practice telling the truth. You practice saying how you really feel. Because part of being in a limerent relationship is always kind of pretending you're not as obsessed as you actually are in there. And so there's this, there's this way you're always sort of translating how you really feel into something you think is socially acceptable. One of the signs of limerence is that when you talk to your friends about this person you're so excited about, they're always like, or, you know, they're acting like, oh gosh, we're sick of hearing about this guy, or hmm, you know, they're worried about you when you talk about him. They don't, they're not quite on board with it. That's a sign. And obviously there would be exceptions, like some friends just can't get behind some, some love interest. But in this case, seven years of pursuing a guy and he wasn't interested at all. I'm guessing your friends were sort of like getting a little tired of your quest, right? So, so pay attention to what people think and become yourself. Start telling the truth. Those friends in that other country, they're not around. Where you are right now, there are people in groups who you can get together with and you can just talk about this. You can say, you know, I feel like I want to go on a date. Um, what I'm worried about is this. Or you can say, I'm having memories about this guy. I would try to avoid social situations or groups where continuing to talk about or think about this guy, Max, is encouraged or tolerated. That's, <laughs> that sometimes is my unique perspective. And some people don't like it, but I'm telling you, if you want to get over anybody, whether they were actually in your life or that it's a limerent thing, stop talking about them. Number one, stop talking about them. Number two, make yourself stop thinking about them. When you catch yourself thinking about them, say, I gotta, oh, I gotta stop thinking about that. And give yourself a few go-to things that you can put your mind on. You know, a nice piece of music, <laughs> a cold drink of water, run up and down the stairs, or some happy memory, some, something that comforts you, where you can just push your mind instead. It's kind of hard to 100% control your mind. But go in this direction. Just take him off your mind. When they say that phrase, wash that man out of your hair, <laughs> that's how you do it. You wash him out of your thinking. You wash him out of your thoughts. Thinking about him is you leaving your life. It's you going off. Because you know, it's not just a fantasy, is it? It's kind of like the world of the dead. It's a world where there is no love and there is no interaction. And there is no contact. It's like the world of the dead. So come back, Elizabeth. Come back to the world of the living where we can love you and we can hear you, okay? So one thing you said that, was, that I thought was important here, you said, I feel if I don't cut ties with him, I'll wait for that social media message from him for the rest of my life and we'll stay single forever. You don't even have ties with him to cut, but the ties that you have with him are mental with the idea of him. And that is, I would totally encourage you to cut those ties. It'll be sad at first, but you'll be surprised how quickly it, it feels better. It feels like um, clean. It feels peaceful to cut ties with an idea that's been torturing you. And that's what I'm hearing. You had said that it's safer to stay in the past because you know what to expect from it. I know how it will go. Uh-huh. Um, I just don't see anything safe about being alone for the rest of your life. That doesn't sound very safe at all. Change is unpredictable and it does give you anxiety and I totally understand it. The future, the future is bumpy and bright. It's both wonderful and scary 
And that's a fact. We're all going to get hurt again <laughs> here and there. But as you continue to recover and you keep yourself out of fantasy and here on earth, you can start to grow your open-hearted capacity to be solid with two feet on the ground and showing love. And that's the kind of person a healthy person can love. And I want you to have a healthy person to love Elizabeth and who will love you right back in the same measure. So I hope that helps you. For anyone watching, if you think that your upbringing has caused you to have CPTSD, take my quiz. It's down there in the description section. You can open it up more and there's more links down there below to all my courses. And if you want to hear another letter from a limerent person, see if you think you might identify with it. I've got that video lined up right here and I will see you very soon.